having just finished talking about why we forget, just a quick reminder, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong in the very normal, typical process of creating, storing, and retrieving memories. But some memory loss is due to damage, some kind of structural damage to the brain. And that brings us to amnesia. Amnesia is not the typical process of creating, storing, and retrieving memories. It is partial or complete loss of memory due to some kind of damage, whether that be physical or psychological. Physical damage is damage to some part of the brain from things like Alzheimer's disease, a stroke, or brain trauma, maybe being in a car accident, or even having some kind of illness. A psychological cause can be triggered by some type of traumatic event. So most memories will return over time, usually within a few days. Most people do not suffer from extreme long-term complete amnesia. So let's talk about the types of amnesia. And I, it's easy to confuse the two types of amnesia with the two types of interference. Interference is proactive and retroactive, moving forward, moving backwards. Amnesia is very similar, but it's not about memories interfering with each other. It's about what do you forget, okay? It's about what you forget, and you should write that down next to your types of amnesia on your notes. Anterograde, or anti, right? Anti being after. This is the inability to remember ongoing events after the incidence of trauma or the onset of the disease that caused the amnesia. So again, I want you to ask yourself, what do they forget? Ant being after, it's after the incident. So someone with anterior grade amnesia is going to not be able to form new memories. Or it's even more simple than that is, let's say they're in a car accident, or let's say something like they were, they were robbed, okay? They were mugged or assaulted. So they're not gonna remember things during or right after the traumatic event, like maybe being asked questions by the police, something like that. Retrograde, again, think throwback to before the incidents. So it's the inability to remember events that occurred before the incidents or trauma um, or the onset, onset of the disease that caused the amnesia. So as severely as they don't remember who they are, where they come from, who their family is, um, or little things, like they don't remember, like let's say it's a car accident, they don't remember having been in the car or why they left or where they were going that day. Okay, so that's being before, retro, throwback, before the incidents. Okay, let's kind of shift gears here from forgetting, although this has lots to do with it, and talk about memory construction. So while tapping our memories, like while trying to remember things, and think about how we're trying, we might be trying to remember very important things. We filter or fill in missing pieces of information to make our recall more coherent or complete. Most of the time, this is a very like subconscious, unconscious thing that we just do kind of automatically, although sometimes it can be kind of motivated, okay, and more conscious. So think of it memory construction and that you're almost creating a memory in order to fill in the blanks. You're constructing the memory to fill in the blanks. A vocab term here is the misinformation effect. You're incorporating misleading information into one's memory of an event. And again, it's not that you do this purposefully. You don't do this to be deceitful. Our brain likes nice, neat, complete pictures, so it fills in the gaps. Think back a couple units to Gestalt principles we will close in things that we see that have holes in them. So of course we'll do it with our memories, whether we know we are doing it or not. Source amnesia, another vocab term is attributing or finding the cause of an event to the wrong source. Okay, so we have experienced, whatever we have experienced, heard, read, or imagined, we misattribute it. So let's say, oh yeah, I was watching this TV show the other day when you actually heard it on the radio. You just forget where you learned the information. Let's talk about true versus false memories. Just like true perception and illusion, real memories or memories that seem real are very difficult to discern. So just because a memory feels real doesn't mean that it is real. Our brain can tell the difference between real and false memories, but we cannot. Okay, so if something was never heard, 
So let's say that you say, I heard this guy say. That means that's a memory that is in the temporal or audi auditory cortex, right? There would be no sensory record to be activated in that auditory cortex in your temporal lobe. If you, if you didn't actually hear it, that part of your brain would not be stimulated when you recall that false memory. So if the brain was analyzed when you were told about how you heard the false fact, the temporal lobe would not be activated upon remembering that memory. Kind of interesting. Otherwise, there's really no difference. So let's talk a little bit more about constructed memories and the research surrounding them. Elizabeth Loftus is a huge name that you must, 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 must remember. She conducted much research in this arena. What she did is she contacted parents of college students and she obtained a list of childhood events that the students were asked to recall. Okay, so she talked to their parents. What were some things your child did? Did you go to Disney World? Did you go to all these other vacation places? Did you have a babysitter? Blah, blah, blah. To those lists were added plausible, meaning it could have happened events that never actually happened, like being lost in a shopping mall, spilling a punch bowl at the wedding, or meeting Bug Bugs Bunny at Disney World. This is impossible because Bugs Bunny um, is not a Disney character. After repeated recall attempts over a period of several days, many of the students claimed to remember the bogus memory. So what she did after getting these childhood events and then adding some false stuff. She sat down and was interviewing with these college students and they, she would say to them, so tell me about that time you were lost at Northgate Mall. Like, wow, that must've been so traumatic for you. Um, and after like a couple of days of questioning like this, they were lock, stock and barrel like, oh my gosh, yeah, that was so awful. I remember finally finding like the mall security, like police officer guy and I was, crying hysterically like they remembered all these details about being lost in the shopping mall when she had gotten clarification from the kids parents they were never lost in the shopping mall so what does that say about eyewitness testimony is it accurate can we really depend enough so much on eyewitness testimony to send someone to prison for life or even death row can we really do that Often eyewitness testimony is full of errors. It is still one of the main methods used to gain information about crimes though. Important things to remember, people's recollections are less influenced by leading questions if they're forewarned that questions could create memory bias. So even you right now being aware that the way that someone asks me questions is going to create memory bias on my part, it's going to help you avoid that. Passage of time allows original memories to fade, so ask right away for more accurate information or write things down. And then the age of the witness matters. Younger children and adults over 65 may be especially susceptible to influence of misinformation, and we'll kind of talk about why in the development unit in a couple of units. So let's talk about ways to improve memory, and this is actually a whole separate standard by itself according to College Board, so it could definitely be on the test. You've got to study repeatedly to, reboost, to boost recall of long term, over long term, right? And we talked about this with Ebbinghaus and the forgetting curve. It's not just you, retain, you learn the information and then it slowly decays. It's you learn the information, it decays. You've got to review it again, it decays. You've got to review it again, it slightly even more slightly, even less decays. Spend more time rehearsing or actively thinking about the material and that you can't just sit and get. You've gotta be writing things down and thinking about examples and how does this apply to me and rehearsing it in your brain, saying things over and over again. Which is related to number three, make the material personally meaningful. What does this mean to you? And think about how you have seen it in your life before. And then use mnemonic devices, so associate with peg words, something you've already stored. You make up a story or you chunk and use acronyms. All of these things helping you to improve memory. Activate retrieval cues, mentally recreate the situation in the mood. So if you're on a test question, let's say you're like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know this, I just have to remember. So if you think back to when you learned it, or maybe, okay, I know this would be in this set of notes. So if I just think about what those notes look like or when I was taking those, those retrieval cues will help you remember. Recall events while they are fresh before you encounter misinformation. So this is a very big pointer when remembering someone's name. 
um, advice that I've heard is that you know you shake someone's hand and they tell you who you are you repeat their name to them hi Sally I'm Mandy how are you today and having repeated their name it's more ingrained in your brain you recall the events while they're fresh minimize interference so test your own knowledge if you test your own knowledge and you do so by not looking at notes not looking in the book you just simply bam what is the answer it's going to reduce the likelihood of interference and then rehearse the information determine what you do not yet know and this is a big word that I want you to write down is metacognition which is knowing what you know which in turn means you know what you don't know you know what I really am struggling with this whole proactive retroactive interference simply knowing that I don't know the difference between those two interference types is a step in the right direction right so then you're able to determine okay I don't know this so you're able to actively pursue that information and being aware of what you do know helps you to elaborate on it more.